Besides, we now know that the former director of the CIA and current secretary of state and America's deadliest care bear, Mike Pompeo, was in... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He was encouraged to lie in the CIA. When I was a cadet, what's the first, what's the cadet motto at West Point? You will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. Mm. I, I, I was a CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, stole. It's like, we, we, had, we, had, entire, we had entire training courses. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it reminds you of the, uh, uh, the glory of the American experiment. Yes, the glory of the American experiment, where they sit there and say, how many times can we get these dopes to believe our McCarthy is bullshit? Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Uh, you might notice some laughter in this episode, some laughter coming in in the backdrop, some people talking uh, from, from, from the shadows, so it might seem. Uh, but that's because this was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. That's right. It was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. I do um, weekly Zoom, almost weekly Zoom shows uh, called The Citizen revolution and then they become episodes of Forkful of Noodles that you're watching right now. So if you want to be a part of the live virtual audience, you can totally do that. You totally have the opportunity to do that. Uh, it's super fun. We get to have a Q&A and a discussion at the very end of it. Uh, and uh, I get to meet you guys and hang out with you guys and talk to you guys. So if you want to be a part of that experience, you can grab your tickets right now. And uh, as a special treat, if you become a sustaining member, you get free tickets to these live virtual stand-up comedy shows that happen almost every single Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. So make sure you grab those tickets. You can go to my website at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, and lastly, I want to say that uh, we uh, were able to raise some money to help the folks at uh, Action for Assange uh, to get down to D.C. to cover this trial. So if you want to continue helping them out, check them out at Action for Assange. Uh, make sure you donate to them. Make sure you help them uh, give you guys the, the accurate news when it comes to Julian Assange. So uh, without any further ado, let's dive into this. So America touts itself to be the, the bastion of freedoms, right? Everything we do in this country is based on the concept of freedoms. In one week, I hear the phrase, I can do whatever I want because it's a free country, like at least a dozen times, right? And that statement is inaccurate in so many ways. Like America is the definition of a capitalist state, which means everything has a price tag, including your country. And you can't really do whatever you want because you know, like laws and stuff, <laughs> like those exist. Like for example, like, like you can't masturbate in front of a church on Sunday as the congregation is leaving. That's like a bad idea, right? That's, that's just rude and unnecessary, even if you say it's a protest. Because here's the thing, I've been to a couple protests and none have made me feel that good. <laughs> Look, if public urination is considered <laughs> exposing yourself and can get you put on a list then rubbing one out in front of the lord has to put you on like all the lists like a hundred percent of them so it turns out that you can't do whatever you want you know because of because we have laws and stuff regardless uh, there are certain freedoms that i think americans uh, take for granted or just plain forget about right a lot of these freedoms involve the first amendment it grants Americans the right to free speech, religion, expression, protesting, and even petitioning the government and, of course, the press. 
Now, freedom of press ensures that journalists can tell us the truth when our government isn't. Freedom of press is for everyone that publishes information, not just the quote unquote good journalists, right? And, and if it were only for the quote unquote good journalists, how can we explain Brian Williams' career? Or I don't know, Tucker Carlson's career, or Rachel <laughs> Maddow's, or Anderson Cooper, or, or, or that old prospector outside my apartment that keeps yelling, extra, extra, read all about it. Can't. Yeah. I feel personally attacked. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different prospector, Steve. It's a different prospector. <laughs> I have multiple prospectors outside my apartment. <laughs> but look, these are not good journalists, right? Brian Williams orgasmed over a war on national television. Rachel Maddow has been spreading a conspiracy theory for over four years. And that prospector won't stop looking for gold in my car. These folks, at best, are corporate propagandists and, and also well, one prospector that's probably going to get sued soon, if I'm being honest, right? Like, look, it's a Honda, Randy. Okay, there's no gold in there. It's a very economical car. It's a very nice and economical car. But if you, if you do think that journalists have a, a little too much freedom, then fear not. There is a, a, a very nice... Uh, authoritarian law that has been put into place to, to ensure that there are less press freedoms for everybody. On June 15, 1917, two months after America entered World War I, Democratic President Woodrow Wilson and his Congress passed the Espionage Act. The Espionage Act made it a crime for any persons to convey information to interfere with the United States military, the war effort, or promote the success of the country's enemies. And if you're found guilty under the Espionage Act, you go to prison for about 20 years and you could be fined up to $10,000. Now, that's, that was in 1917. So that's like 1917 money. So with like the cost of inflation, that's like a million dollar fine and over a hundred years in prison. Now, the issue with the Espionage Act is the language in the legislation was so vague that it would just go after anybody it saw fit, including folks that remained neutral about the World War I efforts, right? Like, like if you were an entertainer, for example, if you were an entertainer in 1917 and you didn't say, give it up for the troops, huh? Give it up for the tr every 12 minutes, then they could, like, kill you because, you know, you're like a commie pinko freedom-hating bastard. It really puts nationalistic pride into law. And this is the authoritarian's Pandora's box that has led to stripping away Americans' most fundamental rights. And because of this fear, the American public has given away those rights willingly. But fear not, folks. Fear not, Woodrow Wilson did not stop there. In 1918, he signed the Sedition Act, which banned the, quote, disloyal, profane, scurrilous, and abusive language about the United States government, the Constitution, the armed forces, or the flag. I mean, this was the jelly to the authoritarian peanut butter that was the Espionage Act. That's really what it was. I mean, this made sure that you couldn't call any politician a fuck nugget in writing or out loud. You could whisper it, though. Now, if you think about, if you think about it, this, this law was really written into place to make sure that foreign spies weren't coming into the United States to, you know, steal state secrets and American jobs, and white women. It's really what they were <laughs> trying to protect. But in reality, this act was put into place to persecute socialists, pro-labor, and anti-war activists. Like in 1918, there was a socialist named Schenck who was passing out leaflets discouraging men to join the war and was arrested 
under the Espionage Act. Guys, he didn't even make a full pamphlet or a brochure. He made a one-page leaflet. I mean, he was imprisoned for a single eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Like, not even good paper, you know? Like, not cardstock. <laughs> like, we're talking about basic, shitty <laughs> paper. That's what he went to prison for. And he was, he was brought in under the Espionage Act, which provided for up to 20 years in prison, by the way, for saying things. And he was convicted, and he came up before the Supreme Court, cited, he said, how about the First Amendment? The Supreme Court was unanimous. Supreme Court unanimously determined that the Espionage Act specifically was not violating the freedom of speech or press by jailing people for, you know, like speaking or just reporting the misdeeds of America. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote the decision. Oliver Wendell Holmes has a great reputation, an intellectual, uh, and, you know, uh, one of the really awesome figures in American uh, jurisprudence, intellectual history, and so on and so on. Well, he says what people have said now. If you hear this all the time. Your mother said it, maybe your father said it, your brother-in-law said it, who knows? Somebody you heard said this. So look, freedom of speech is fine, but you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. Right? How many times have you heard that? Yeah, guys. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater, but you can yell terrorism in a paranoid nation till all the brown countries bend the knee to your whims. So you can't do that. <laughs> I mean, really, how are you supposed to let people know that there's a fire, right? Like, like the most dangerous game of telephone ever. You know, hey, <clears throat> there's a fire. Pass it on. <laughs> like, you know, by the end of it, some guy is going to make it about his dick, right? Like, that's it's always what happens. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we can we can make a proclamation of some kind, right? Just stand up and be like, "Hello, I'd like to make the following statement: We did not start the fire, but there is one burning. It wasn't always burning because that's not how arson works. We should probably leave this theater and catch a different showing of Eat, Pray, Love." <laughs> Now, also in 1918, socialist presidential candidate Eugene Debs was arrested in Canton, Ohio, under the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act for giving an anti-war speech. The working class who fight all the battles, the working class who make the supreme sacrifices, the working class who freely shed their blood and furnish their corpses, have never yet had a voice in either declaring war or making peace. Quick sidebar. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure Mark Ruffalo is not like the reincarnated version of Eugene Debs. As much as, <laughs> as much as some of us would like that to be true. Uh, but I will say Professor Hulk is probably a socialist, you guys because he's anti-war, non-violent, right? He's pro-science, and he shared his tacos with Ant-Man. <laughs> so, now, Eugene Debs, uh, after he made his speech, uh, was sentenced to, to three 10-year terms in prison in 1918. Uh, from prison, he ran for president in 1920 and got a million votes. Now, mm -hmm. his sentence was, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> uh, his sentence was commuted because the courts decided uh, that the Sedition Act was just too crazy. <laughs> but they were like, let's keep the Espionage Act in place just to balance things out a little bit. Let's keep doing that. Look, it says something that the courts decided that the Sedition Act is kind of crazy. And I mean, under the Sedition Act, you couldn't even criticize what the American military was wearing for fuck's sake, right? Which, <laughs> which really begs the question, 
what did Woodrow Wilson have in mind for the troops to wear in 1918, right? Star-spangled capes and a fucking tutu. <laughs> Honestly, I think he probably wanted all the entire troops to dress up like Uncle Sam on the battlefield. I think that's what he really wanted. Like with the striped pants and everything? Striped pants, everybody's got to grow a beard and also be 100 years old. <laughs> they all have to <laughs> age rapidly. <laughs> yeah. Which is not discreet. It's, I don't, you know, don't want to make a controversial statement here, but uh, Uncle Sam, not, not discreet. Not discreet. If you're going behind enemy lines, I feel like if you're dressed like the American flag, you're probably going to get shot in the face. So, <laughs> just a quick thought there. Now, the ultimate proof that these pieces of legislation were not about spies or Russians stealing our women and drinking our vodka is Woodrow Wilson's 1915 State of the Union Address. And now this was given two years before America entered the war and the uh, Espionage Act was, was passed. So uh, Woodrow Wilson in his speech states, <laughs> there's an accurate representation of Woodrow Wilson, you guys, very accurate <laughs> representation. He says, uh, there are citizens of the United States, I blush to admit, born under other flags, but welcomed under our generous naturalization laws to the full freedom and opportunity of America, who have poured the poison of disloyalty into the very arteries of our national life, who have sought to bring the authority and the good name of our government into contempt to destroy our industries wherever they thought it effective for their vindictive purposes to strike at them and debase our politics to use, uh, to the uses of foreign intrigue. Oh man. How could they? <laughs> I know, these bastards. The beginning of the statement is basically Wilson stating that he's embarrassed that America is a nation of immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> And that naturalization is bestowed upon them by the good graces of the bank-owned government. <laughs> I mean, realistically, right, it, within the, the very beginning of the statement, he's making the good immigrant argument, right? It's, it's the argument that if you're an immigrant, you do exactly what you're told. When you're told, you get the gifts of citizenship where a bunch of white liberals will yell at you to vote for other old white warmongering liberals. <laughs> it's fun. It's a good time. Now, he makes another statement, his statement about pouring poison. That's just xenophobia right there, right? It's the argument that foreign cultures are tainting the proud American culture of stealing cultures from black, brown, and indigenous people. <laughs> how could they? Like, ridiculous. Exactly. I mean, how is America supposed to steal these cultures? if these people are just gonna bring it into the country and share with everybody willingly. That's just rude. It's just rude okay. is what that is. His last statement uh, kind of makes the titans of industry sound like defenseless sheep in a den of wolves, right? Like these uber capitals, uh, capitalists were the ones that enacted the Federal Reserve Act, which funded American wars. And bo all these capitalists were enriching themselves from both sides. Don't forget that John D. Rockefeller was selling the Nazis American Standard Oil. Right? The good name of the government he speaks of is one that has used the military, a military force countless times to attack, maim, and kill striking workers. Remind me again, what kind of a democracy does that? Oh, that's right, an authoritarian democracy, <laughs> you know? One where you get to choose your masters. Right? You, you, you get to choose between healthcare and your job, or you get to choose between crippling debt or having a home. Right? You, get to, you, get to, you guys get the point. You guys see what I'm doing there. Right? Standing, standing up for worker rights and ensuring that the working class is taken care of isn't foreign intrigue. It's the most domestic issue there is. Right? Calling it foreign intrigue means that you're willing to use the military against people fighting for the rights of other people. But Wilson doesn't stop there. Oh no, if you thought that was the end of Wilson's speech, boy, were we all wrong. 
He goes, <laughs> he, goes on, <laughs> he goes on to say, I urge you to enact such laws at the earliest possible moment and feel that in doing so, I am urging you to do nothing less than save the honor and self-respect of the nation. Such creatures of passion, disloyalty, and anarchy must be crushed out. There are, not ma- there are not many, but they are infinitely malignant, and the hand of our power should close on them at once. They have formed plots to destroy property. They have entered into conspiracies against the, gov- the neutrality of the government. They have sought to pry into every confidential transaction of the government in order to serve interests alien to our own. It is possible to deal with these things very effectually. I need not suggest the terms in which they may be dealt. This is a declaration of war on American citizens that want to improve the lives of other average American citizens. I don't know if you guys know this or not, uh, but it's a fun trick that you guys can, it's like, a par- it's like a fun party trick that you can do, right? If you play the audio of one of Wilson's speeches over just the video of one of Hitler's speeches, they almost sync up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <They> almost. <laughs> Yeah, if you all you have to do in most of the speeches is replace the the word socialist for Jews, there it's almost a, <laughs> basically the same. It's interesting, right? Like how Wilson refers to the people asking a government to practice social responsibility and have transparency and equality for all uh, all its people as anarchists who are malignant and must be crushed by the hand of the government. <laughs> Remember, yeah. the, the two people in 1918 that were arrested were socialists passing out information and giving a speech. They weren't speaking out against violence, or, or rather, they were speaking out against violence rather than creating it, as Wilson suggests and invokes in his address. I mean, he, he ends that statement with a cryptic West message of having to say what measures must be taken to deal with the threat, right? This is kind of like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge of authoritarianism right there. That's basically what he's doing. Now, it did take Congress about two years to pass the Espionage Act. After peace talks with Germany went south in February of 1915, the Senate passed it immediately, but the House dragged their feet. What the House wanted to do before the bill was passed, they had a few amendments. They had a few points that they wanted to, uh, to add in there, and a lot of them included tighter restrictions on freedom of the press. So as many freedoms as the American Bill of Rights grants us, the one that the government has used against us the most is the freedom of fear. Fear is how Americans vote what the religious industrial complex uses, and how Americans treat their neighbors. Presidents like Woodrow Wilson have legislated that freedom of fear into things like the Espionage Act, which eventually gave birth to the Patriot Act, the Rosemary's Babies of all legislations. (coughs) One person, I'll take it. All right. (laughs) (laughs) I wasn't sure who was going to get that reference, but (laughs) I I got you, boo. I got you. I'll take the one chortle. (laughs) But look, the Espionage Act, the Patriot Act, this is not what we need, right? These are the freedom of fear is not what we need. What we need is a freedom of education, the freedom of enlightenment, the freedom of transparency and the freedom of equality. All of these freedoms would eradicate the need for bills like the Espionage Act. But since, uh, since the Espionage Act was kept in place by the courts, it got a chance to grow up, right? Along the way, 52 Americans were convicted under the Espionage Act. And it wasn't uh, just targeting peaceniks and socialists anymore. It was pushing the Red Scare and helping pave the way for McCarthyism 2.0. Now, McCarthyism Prime 
was happening all through the late 1800s and early 1900s with the smearing of uh, the labor movement, which was driven by Eugene Debs, Mother Jones, the International Workers of the Word, and they were being dubbed as anti-freedom commie bastards, all right? Anybody who was motivated by greed looked at them as a threat to their bottom line. So the Espionage ad Act aided in this Red Scare. Now, McCarthyism 2.0 reinforced by the Espionage Act was going after anyone they believed was treasonous, you know, like average citizens like Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, who were given the death penalty for, being, for having suspected ties to communist Russia. Yeah. Well, it's really nice to see a piece of authoritarianism graduate from like a fine and jail time to just straight up murder, isn't it? It's just fun. It's just nice, you know, they just... Oh, so they just proud grow, of them. They just so grow up so fast, you guys. They just grow up so fast. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, uh, it's uh, just oh, one day they're just like jailing socialists, and the next day they're murdering regular citizens without concrete evidence. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. You guys. I'm so sorry, you guys. It's how do I? Fascism makes me emotional. Just hits you right there. Just hits you right there. But look, over the course of the last 40 to 50 years, the Espionage Act has been a key factor in discriminating against whistleblowers who reveal America's corporate war crimes, right? The Espionage Act at this point should just be called the Kill the Messengers Initiative or Operation Fuck Your Mailman. <laughs> Which, by the way, that second one is some of our fantasies and the name of a really fun porno. Yes. I highly recommend it. Now, in 1971, a former military analyst working for the Rand Corporation, Daniel Ellsberg, revealed the Pentagon Papers. It's very important to note that he didn't sell the Pentagon Papers to the Chinese or the Vietnamese or Russian intelligence, he freely gave them over to the New York Times. The Times then published portions of the 7,000 page document. With the Pentagon Papers, 7,000 pages, each yep. stamp top secret, revealed that for the 23 year period from 45 to 68, uh, president after president, four in that in that telling, uh, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, had systematically lied to the public every time they spoke about policy in Vietnam, about what the prospects were, why we were there, what the costs were and were likely to be, both the human costs and the material costs. Uh, every aspect of it was concealed from the Congress and the public by lies and by secrecy and by uh, um, silence of people in it, which had included me for years. I'd been involved in Vietnam policy from 64 on. And he doesn't really talk about this in the interview, but the Pentagon Papers did also reveal uh, that President Lyndon B. Johnson was the only president out of all four presidents mentioned in the Pentagon Paper that did not wear pants during his meetings about Vietnam. <laughs> Good man. Good man. Good man. <laughs> it's 102 degrees here. You gotta, yeah, you got to, yeah, the, hey, the man did what he needed to do, you know? That's what, that's what Lyndon B. Johnson was known for. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the thing. Despite not being mentioned in the Pentagon Papers, Richard Milhouse Nixon, America's premier paranoid president, uh, decided that he had to take Ellsberg down. At this point, Daniel Ellsberg was looking at 115 years in prison under the Espionage Act. I mean, is it just me, or do you guys feel like authoritarians don't realize that human beings don't live that long? <laughs> <laughs> They're going by average lifespan with adrenochrome. That's what they're going by. <laughs> they go by immortality life forms. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But let's let's just even say like some humans did live 
that long, right? Let's say that you had a centennial human in prison. Wouldn't that just be the abject definition of elder abuse? <laughs> Weren't we yeah. taught to respect our elders? And I feel like putting them in prison, not really respecting them, not really showing them a whole lot of respect. Now, here's the thing. Here's the problem with Richard Nixon. He made a critical error when he hired a bunch of goons, the same goons that he would use uh, in the Watergate scandal later uh, at the end of his presidency to break into Ellsberg's doctor's office to find dirt on him. And when they were caught, it led to a mistrial and Ellsberg's eventual freedom. When he heard that it had been revealed and was supposed to be revealed in court, uh, that my former psychoanalyst had been had his office burglarized by agents of the White House. Uh, they were seeking information to get me to shut up, blackmail me into silence about what I knew about the ongoing campaign and the plans for renewed, for continued bombing. Uh, it took still uh, another month for my trial to end because uh, Nixon kept the attorney general and the acting criminal, the head of the criminal division from revealing to the court what had been revealed to them by John Dean, that my doctor's office had been broken into. And finally, they said they were in obstruction of justice, to a familiar term, right? It's not going on right now, including involving the president, and saying they went to him and said they would have to resign, lest they be subject to trial themselves for obstruction of justice, for not giving this information to the court. Look, I want to put this on the record, okay? Say what you will about Richard Nixon, but that man was consistent at being a crook. I mean, you gotta give him <laughs> you gotta give him credit for that. Here's the thing: like Nixon could have made himself look really, really good at the end of all this, right? War criminal Henry Kissinger, uh, he pointed out that this could be spun as the Democrats' war and it gave them an opportunity to pull out of Vietnam. The war was still going on under a new president, uh, Richard Nixon, who was not featured in at all in the Pentagon Papers. He wasn't incriminated by it. And in fact, on this day, June 13th, when they began coming up, Henry Kissinger's uh, first reaction in speaking to the president as his national security advisor said, uh, this actually, helps us a little bit because it shows it's a Democrats' war, which was, was true, uh, and that the Democrats had mucked it up. And it had been my hope, actually, that uh, if it came out early enough, uh, when I first copied it in 1969, that Richard Nixon would see the opportunity to use these very documents and say the war has been ruined by uh, years of Democratic uh, mismanagement of it, and there's no choice but to get out at this point. Uh, he could say whatever he wanted about the origins of the war. He could lie and say, uh, like all the others, and say that it was a noble cause for freedom and independence. Uh, but it was not uh, practical now to keep it going. Kill him. That's what I had hoped he would say. But instead of all that, what Richard Nixon decided to do was decrease ground troops after 100,000 American soldiers had already died and increase all of the bombings. This is pretty much, <laughs> yeah, this is very similar to how Obama handled the Middle East, right? By decreasing ground troops, but increasing drone warfare and wedding explosions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, lot more, a lot more weddings exploded at that point. <laughs> now, Ellsberg is just the first of a long list of whistleblowers that the United States government has persecuted under the Espionage Act, right? The most famous of these victims is former NSA analyst Edward Snowden, or as some folks might know, know him as a woke Joseph Gordon-Levitt lookalike. That's because he played Edward Snowden in the movies. <laughs> I didn't know how many people were gonna actually remember that movie was actually made. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Now, Edward Snowden revealed that the United States government was co uh, collecting mass amounts of data and using our cell phones to spy on the American people as if, you know, like we were all spies. Like the United States government is basically like that one friend that thinks everybody is talking about them all the time and then freaks out on strangers at the bar, you know, which 
which just makes wing night awkward all the time for everybody. That's all it does. Now, once he found this information, Snowden freely gave the information to journalist Glenn Greenwald of The Intercept. Again, he didn't sell it to China or Russia or a fucking balding supervillain living inside a volcano. <laughs> he gave it to a journalist. I mean, this is an argument that's used against whistleblowers all the time, every single day on, on corporate media, whenever they bring up whistleblowers. Well, you know, they, they could have sold it to some kind of foreign intelligence. Yeah, but they didn't. Yeah, but they could have, though. Yeah, yeah, well, they fucking didn't. Yeah, but what if, oh my God, how are you a news network? <laughs> how are you a place for information? And now, because the United States hates getting caught with its pants down, which some people believe is because the U.S. has a complex about its dick size not measuring up to the rest of the world. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Which really, I got to say, is why the U.S. should really start using the metric system. But this, that is a different subject <laughs> for a different time. <laughs> but because the United States hates getting caught with its pants down, they tried to get Snowden's asylum request denied by virtually every single European country. Right? Snowden was eventually granted asylum in Ecuador, but he had to get there from Hong Kong, which meant that he had to fly through Russia. The U.S. Intelligence Service and the Obama administration knew his flight landed in Moscow when they revoked his passport, stranding him in exile in Russia. What I wasn't expecting was that the United States government itself, as you said, uh, would cancel my passport. So I'm stopped at, at passport control, and there's this, uh, you know, the standard passport officer. And um, when I go through the line, uh, he takes a little bit too long. Uh, he picks up the phone, he makes a call, uh, and I, I realize it's longer than everybody else. And suddenly he looks at me and just says, uh, there is problem with passport, <laughs> you know, uh, come with. And so I'm led very quickly into this um, business lounge. <laughs> which is very much not standard. Uh, normally you'd be taken off to a, a security area and I go in and it's a, a room full of Russian guys in, in business suits. Right? And the first thing I'm thinking about, because every alarm bell in my head is uh, ringing, is are they recording this? Are they using this to try to blackmail me, to coerce me? I mean, so immediately I go, look, uh, I worked for the CIA. I, I know what this is. I know what this, uh, how this is supposed to go. This is not going to be that kind of conversation. I'm so you declined their, the, the Russian intelligence request to cooperate then. You got stuck in the airport for 40 days. Because um, you said something very important, which was that I was trapped in that airport for 40 days. Again, for those people who might be a little bit skeptical of me, if I had cooperated with the Russian government, right, if you think I'm a Russian spy, I would have been in that airport for five minutes before they drove me out in a limo, you know, to the palace where I would be living for the rest of my days before they, you know, throw the parade where they call me a hero of uh, Russia. I applied for asylum in 27 different countries around the world, uh, places like Germany, France, Norway, that I thought the U.S. government and the American public uh, would be much more comfortable with me being there. And yet we saw something extraordinary happen, just, just one thing, which is that uh, the U.S. government worked quite hard to make sure I didn't leave Russia, to the point that they actually grounded uh, the presidential aircraft of the president of Bolivia, uh, which is like grounding Air Force One. It's something that's really unprecedented in diplomatic history. And it's very much an open question today. Um, why did the U.S. government work so hard to keep me in Russia? Basically, this gave them the opportunity to claim that he was a Russian spy. Oh, and then the NSA can finally live out their James Bond fetish. <laughs> they can finally become one of the Bond girls as an entire agency, you guys. It's a big deal. It's a big deal, right? The NSA can be transformed from the National Security Agency to the National Pussy Galore Agency. Oh, man. <laughs> It's fun, right? It's fun when dreams come true at the expense of innocent people. It's a good time, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> now, there are some people that look at someone like Edward Snowden and say, well, why can't he just come home and face the music? But if he did come home, the music would be 
listening to Nickelback in a jail cell for life without a fair trial. And I believe listening to Nickelback is against the Geneva Convention. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what he says about, about coming back home. I would not have uh, received a, a fair trial. Uh, there would not have been much of a trial at all. Uh, I would only have received a sentencing. And the question there is, um, what message does that send, whether you like me or not? Uh, I could be the best person in the world. I could be the worst. What message does a conviction where you spend the rest of your life in prison for telling journalists things that change the laws of the United States, uh, that have re resulted in the most substantive reforms to intelligence authorities uh, since the 1970s, uh, if the only result of doing that is a life sentence in prison, the next person who sees something criminal happening in the United States government uh, will be discouraged from coming forward, and I can't be a part of that. And that denial of trial, that denial of fair trial, was under the Obama administration, who evoked the Espionage Act more than any other president. Right? Look, the Obama administration had every opportunity to undo this legacy of democratic authoritarianism that was left behind by their predecessors, but they didn't. Right? Obama exiled Snowden, and he only commuted Chelsea Manning's sentence. Manning was the U.S. Army soldier that revealed documents proving that the American military was killing Afghani civ civilians and international journalists to WikiLeaks. If Obama truly believed that these war crimes are something that the country should atone for, he would have started by completely pardoning Chelsea Manning. And thanks to Obama handing the keys to a dictator's playbook to our current president and best CIA asset, he's the best, no one's better, no one's a better puppet of the CIA, Donald Trump, uh, I have to do, legally I'm supposed to do the fingers and the hands when I mention his name, um, but <laughs> now Donald Trump is persecuting even more whistleblowers under his regime. One of these whistleblowers is a, uh, someone by the name of Daniel Everett Hale. A former U.S. intelligence analyst was arrested Thursday and charged with violating the Espionage Act for allegedly leaking documents about the secretive U.S. drone program. 31-year-old Daniel Hale was arrested in Nashville, Tennessee. He faces up to 50 years in prison. Hale was enlisted in the Air Force from 2009 to 2013, during which he worked with the National Security Agency and the Joint Special Operations Task Force at the Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan, where he helped identify targets to be assassinated. He later worked as a contractor for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Hale's accused of disclosing 11 top secret or secret documents to a reporter. The indictment does not name the reporter, but unnamed government sources have told media outlets the reporter is investigative journalist Jeremy Scahill of The Intercept. Now, in 2015, The Intercept did put out a series of stories called The Drone Papers, which outlined how the Obama administration was using inaccurate technology and kill lists to take out people they considered, quote unquote, dangerous. Um, what we've published uh, is an extensive uh, look into how this program has operated historically, but specifically under President Obama. One of the most significant uh, uh, findings of this, and my colleague Cora Courier really dug deep into this, um, is we published for the first time the kill chain what the bureaucracy of assassination looks like. And what you see is that um, all of these officials, including people like the Treasury Secretary, are part of uh, signing off on all of this, uh, at where they have these secret meetings uh, and they discuss who's going to live and die around the world. And at the end of that process, it is the President of the United States who signs what, what amounts to a uh, death warrant. Uh, for whoever they've decided should die based on what amounts to a parallel secret uh, judicial system in the United States that is not really subjected to any kind of judicial review, where the president acts sort of as emperor, issues an edict that you die. And what we show, and, and this is the first time that, that there's documentary evidence of this, is that the president gives the military a 60-day window to hunt down and kill these individuals. 
Uh, Ken Roth from Human Rights Watch uh, pointed out today, if the standard is that the people who are uh, being targeted uh, for assassination uh, is that they represent an imminent threat, which is what the president says the U.S. policy is, uh, then why do they have 60 days to do it? Why don't they need to do it now if it's imminent? Well, that's because they've redefined the term imminent uh, to, to, to be so vague as to not even resemble its actual commonly understood definition. So here's the thing. When I was in high school, <clears throat> a girl that had a crush on me put me on a kill list when I didn't reciprocate those feelings. I was number four, which let's be honest, hurt. That hurt. Number four? <laughs> number four, I, I, I wasn't even in the top three. Come on. What the fuck? Right? It must have not been that great of a crush. But look, the school administrators found out about it, and they suspended her from school and ensured that she got psychiatric care. When a 15-year-old has a kill list, she's removed from society. When a president has one, he gets the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I, don't, I think that's not just an insult to what the prize represents, but all of the words in Nobel Peace <laughs> Prize. <laughs> Hale was arrested and indicted for revealing information to a journalist and currently faces 50 years in prison. You know who's facing zero years in prison? All of the people that had a fucking kill list and used million dollar drones to rain death from the skies. By the way, uh, Death from the Skies is also the title of the newest Steven Seagal film that's going right to VHS. VHS. <laughs> very, very exciting. He is still alive, uh, you guys. <laughs> Just wanted to let everybody know. <laughs> but look, the, the Espionage Act protects real sociopaths and murderers, but ensures the people who had a conscience about, the, about their misdeeds face a lifetime in prison. Now, the primary reason these whistleblowers are villainized is because uh, they're calling out American war crimes, and that is deemed treasonous. So let's find out what the definition of treason actually is. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. So you have to be waging war against the nation in order to be convicted of treason. Waging war. If that's the definition of treason, then the entire Confederacy should be considered treasonous. But instead of that, we put up statues of them and fucking named <laughs> streets after them. There were U.S. bankers helping the Nazis funnel money, like Prescott Bush, and we let his kids and grandkids become presidents that lead us into more wars. Right. Major U.S. corporations like the, the Rockefellers, GM, and Ford all aided the Nazis, and we hailed them as the pride of American innovation. Look, my first car was a 1996 Ford Taurus. And it was a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> that car fucking sucked. It, every, every, every week it was something new with that car. And now that I know that Ford was helping the Nazis, all of that makes sense. Build Ford tough. <laughs> Build Ford tough, just, which is basically one small way for a Nazi sympathizer to win against minorities. That's all that is. <laughs> And the obvious one that we've seen time and time again, especially in the, in the recent months, is the militarized police being unleashed on protesters asking for less militarized police and to stop murdering innocent civilians. I mean, that is basically a war on American citizens by the government. And remember, Eugene Debs said that the working class don't get to declare war or peace. Only the oligarchs get to do that. And that hasn't changed. Right? Rich politicians from fucking Trump to Pelosi to McConnell to Schumer, they've all used their militarized police to continue creating upheaval through an emboldened and racist system. 
So wouldn't that make anybody that uses these cops to wage a war on our streets to be treasonous? Whistleblowers aren't treasonous. They're heroes. They're shedding light on, a gov on, on governmental misdeeds, and they shouldn't be punished for that. Instead, they should be rewarded for it. We should be putting authoritarian, treasonous war profiteers in prison and giving these whistleblowers the Nobel Peace Prize. Of course, the most prominent of all these cases uh, that show the true brutality of the Espionage Act is the trial of Julian Assange. The Australian publisher is currently facing 175 years in prison if he's extradited to the United States for revealing how American soldiers are committing war crimes in the Middle East, right? The CIA is using smart devices to, to spy on its citizens. Credit card companies are defrauding their customers and how insane Scientology really is. And that's just scratching the surface of what Julian Assange and WikiLeaks have revealed to the world. I mean, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks have revealed so many different kinds of war crimes and corporate fraud that Skittles is coming out with, this, with a new bag of flavors to capitalize on these tragedies. <laughs> yeah, very exciting, guys. Skittles, <laughs> taste the war crime. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. Is that the sour ones? Those are <laughs> those are all of the that's it's just the sour parts in a yeah. bag. That's <laughs> all it is. <laughs> mm, doesn't get better. <laughs> uh, we talked a little, a little about this at the top of uh, of our discussion, but currently Julian Assange is in Belmarsh Prison, which, as Steve mentioned, is the U is the UK's Guantanamo Bay. Right, UK basically decided, hey, why let America have all the fun, huh? <laughs> we can torture people willy-nilly too, you know? After all, they are the OG imperialists. And look, there isn't any argument that he's not being tortured, right? He is indefinitely being tortured. UN, Rep UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Melger, has confirmed that Assange is a victim of torture. And to recap why he's in Belmarsh, Assange was dragged out of the Ecuadorian embassy where he had lived in the asylum for seven years when the conservative president of Ecuador revoked his asylum and sent the UK police in. He was sent to prison for supposedly skipping bail for a trial in Sweden for a crime he did not commit. Like when, even when Sweden found out about that, they were like, wait, what, what's happening right now? What are we doing? He was supposed to be in Belmarsh for 50 weeks. That was determined in April of 2019. He's now well past that 50 week mark and is still in prison. Because of his deteriorating health conditions, he's at high risk of getting COVID-19, especially in a prison where the guards and the prisoners are not wearing masks, right? I think by proxy, that makes the Espionage Act anti-mask. <laughs> we should all be mad. <laughs> now, earlier this year, the extradition trial began where he was subject to disorienting conditions from being moved from room to room, strip search, and kept in a clear box away from his attorneys during the trial. Guys, I have seen serial killers that have said they're willing to eat the judge's faces receive better treatment than this. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> right? For fuck's sake, guys, we are letting a war criminal finger paint and fucking sell them on Etsy while a publisher is in abhorrent conditions. <laughs> this is the society we live in. While the UK courts and the American government are trying to win the world's greatest authoritarian mug, the corporate, mm -hmm. yeah, the corporate media has been spreading lies and smears about Julian Assange. Last year after his arrest, CNN ran an expose where they revealed the true horrors of someone like Julian Assange. One of the, one of the first things they claimed in the article was that uh, Assange smeared feces all over the walls and then, he, and then he punched the guards in the face. And then when people were like, where's the proof, CNN? 
where's the proof of all this? They threw a smoke bomb and disappeared into the Fox News building. <laughs> <laughs> CNN is smearing shit on the name of journalistic integrity. They are the National Enquirer of corporate news. That's what they are. Now, the reason CNN is running these type of smears on Assange is because he revealed the collusion between the DNC and the Clinton campaign in 2016. And because we have a three-way love affair between paranoia, spy movies, and no accountability, <laughs> CNN and MSNBC went down the McCarthyist rabbit hole yet again. And they began by saying that Assange was turning the Ecuadorian embassy into an election meddling headquarters, you know? Like, like Assange was part of the exiled legion of doom, using their superpowers of the press to bring the good guys of the American government to, you know, they can continue drone bombing innocent weddings. You know, like the good guys do. <laughs> You guys remember that comic book where Superman goes into a wedding and, and they were just like, hey, does anybody have anything to say? And he was like, I do. And then he punched uh, the groom into the sun. You guys look, it's just like how good guys. Yeah. <laughs> Laser eyes, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, it's fun good guy stuff. <laughs> now, CNN claimed that he met with Russians, which is true. But he met with anti-Kremlin activist group called the Pussy Riots. Now, <laughs> maybe CNN just isn't mature enough to say pussy without giggling for 48 minutes. Right? I mean, we all know that Ben Shapiro can't say the word at all. <laughs> Which, no. <laughs> that, was, that shit was too much for me. <laughs> It's incredible. And I think uh, we can all agree that CNN is the Ben Shapiro of corporate news. <laughs> but this is like a typical McCarthyist move, right? The, to compare the people of Russia to its leaders. And if all Russians are Kremlin puppets, then wouldn't that make all Americans Trump supporters? Right? Maybe CNN should start waving that MAGA flag around. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Let that global xenophobic hate over invisible lines commence, you guys. Here we go. It's like an Olympic sport. <laughs> now, CNN also claims that uh, Assange met with Russia Today, or RT, you know, the journalist for, uh, that worked for that news network. RT is uh, Russian state television, so it's clearly connected and controlled by Russian intelligence, right? Just the, the same way that that BBC is connected to MI5 or NPR is funded by the American military. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Whoops. This is NPR, National Public Radio. Support for WAMU was provided by Lockheed Martin. Bringing criminals to justice is more important than ever. Advanced systems developed by Lockheed Martin help federal agents get the job done faster. Lockheed Martin, we never forget who we're working for. Whoa! <laughs> is that legitimate? That is what a real is that? That brand on WAMU in the early 2000s. Holy shit. <laughs> what yep. the fuck? <laughs> the local Pittsburgh one runs ads where they're supported by Boeing and Westinghouse. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was, that, yeah. It's fun. It's fun, you guys. <laughs> Look, MSNBC, Fox News, NPR, and CNN bolster CIA talking points, as CNN did with this smear piece. So, so in reality, how can we trust something like CNN, right? Besides, we now know that the former director of the CIA and current secretary of state and America's deadliest care bear, Mike Pompeo, was in... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He was encouraged to lie in the CIA. Uh, when I was a cadet, what's the first, what's the cadet motto at West Point? You will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. Mm. I, I, I was a CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, stole. It's like, we, we, had, we, had, entire, we had entire training courses. Uh, it, uh, 
it, it, it reminds you of the, uh, uh, the glory of the American experiment. Yes, the glory of the American experiment, where they sit there and say, how many times can we get these dopes to believe our McCarthy is bullshit? Oh, man. How many times can we lie to the American public, right? Why would you believe anybody that's a part of, of this narrative, of this narrative of willful lies, right? Besides, the RT journalist went to interview Assange to get an accurate view of the story, something that no corporate American journalist did, not one of them. Now, CNN also claimed that Putin rushed to Assange's aid like the ending of some fucking rom-com, you know? Where the scene where the hero has to run through an airport to get to his lover. <laughs> Imagine that, but with like Putin and Assange, that's what CNN claims happened. Uh, now, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the Committee to Protect Journalists, ACLU, Reporters Without Borders, Freedom of Press Foundation, Center of Constitutional Rights, and a bunch of other organizations are all defending Assange. So with that lot with that transitive property. Does that mean that all of those organizations are also Kremlin toadies now, CNN? This is what binary thinking does. It strips us all away from our logic. We can't see the nuance of any situation. Now, all of the information that CNN presented in their article comes from the security co a security company from Spain that was hired by the Ecuadorian embassy to protect it in case anyone came to harm the, the diplomats that were in there or Assange personally. The company called Undercover Global set up cameras and audio recording equipment to maintain protection, but then they were just spying on Assange. As uh, Fidel Narvaez, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, uh, but he's a former Ecuadorian embassy diplomat who was in the embassy uh, when Julian Assange was, that, was, was there, said that the, an, an embassy isn't a prison. So the UC global surveillance system was treating him like he was already a criminal in prison. UC global sold their surveillance tapes to the CIA and amplified their spying on behalf of the CIA. In fact, David Morales, UC Global's CEO, would call them the American friends in a bunch of their meetings. And this went so far as to putting cameras in the women's bathrooms to spy on Assange's meetings. One of the details in this report in El Pais is that the CIA uh, relied on surveillance foot, uh, equipment that was put inside of the women's bathroom and that it was inside of the women's bathroom where sometimes meetings were held in a bid to avoid uh, this very fear of surveillance. Is that true, that, that meetings were held in there? Well, during those uh, seven years, the surveillance equipment inside the embassy basically uh, grow and uh, multiply. Cameras were installed all over, and one of the few places where they were not cameras, uh, I think, was one of the one of the bathrooms. That's that's right. And and Julian knew that he was being a spy, so he chose to 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 have uh, meetings with his uh, lawyers, prob probably the most sensitive meetings. Not exactly in the bathroom, but just outside the bathroom in a little corridor where he thought that no camera, no microphones will, will reach. But I think he was wrong by, by what <laughs> was uh, discovered now by, by El, um, El Pais with this last report. They were obviously trying to, to get every single corner of that embassy surveilled. Which also means that they picked up the, any activity that was going on inside of the actual women's bathroom, which is just a, um, it's a, it, was a, it was a startling revelation to read. Not just this, but when they found out about Assange's fiance and kids, David Morales tried to basically send an employee of UC Global to steal 
dirty diapers from the trash to get a DNA sample from the feces, which FYI, not how poop works. So I just want to take a moment, uh, and I think all of us together should take this moment to congratulate Mr. David Morales because he is now officially grosser than Jeff Bezos. What an accomplishment. <laughs> Big round of applause for someone to get to. I bet his parents are so proud of how gross he is. Like spying on Assange, especially in the women's bathroom, is a clear violation of attorney-client privileges. And also, I will say, lady bathroom privileges. Okay, that's two things I think we need to be very respectful of. And all of this done was done to validate and bolster the Espionage Act to ensure that those in power are able to commit their corporate war crimes without accountability or punishment. I want to make this point very clear. I don't think there should be any reason that his trial should continue. And there should be no reason why Julian Assange should continue to be in prison. Remember, Daniel Ellsberg's case was done when they found out that Nixon was trying to steal documents from Ellsberg's daughter, or doctor, right? Julian Assange was spied on and tortured by the American government and is still undergoing a fucking trial. The UK judge was completely aware of UC Global's actions within the embassy and is still saying that there needs to be a trial. This is a desperate attempt to ensure that the Espionage Act can crush dissent as Woodrow Wilson wanted. This case basically right now is about whether Julian Assange caused harm instead of inform the public about government misdeeds, right? And both of those things are correct, right? To those in power, what Assange and any whistleblower reveals is to inform the public about the wrongdoings of those in power. The only people that are harmed by this are those in power. These, these people don't have a defense for their criminal activities, so, so they use propaganda and authoritarian tactics to smear Assange's character. I mean, look at the way Mike Pompeo talks about this man. It's time to call out WikiLeaks for what it really is, a non-state hostile intelligence service often abetted by state actors like Russia. They have pretended America's First Amendment freedoms shield them from justice. They may have believed that, but they're wrong. Yeah. That's one of the most famous statements that uh, Mike Pompeo made, non-state hostile intelligence agency. First of all, Assange doesn't have a state because he's not from the United States. He is Australian. <laughs> So, all right, they're not all going to be great, guys. <laughs> but, but look, that's a hard slam. That's a hard slam from Pompeo, right? He took away Assange's state. I mean, is he solid? Is he gaseous? Is he liquid? We don't know. We don't know anymore. <laughs> Pompeo took all of those qualities away from him because he and the CIA got caught spying on the citizens of America and Assange himself. But there is a silver lining because Assange doesn't need a state because he's transcended that, right? The truth has no state. It just is. We'll be putting that on a t-shirt. <laughs> now, Assange's trial sets the president, the precedent that the United States will be able to arrest people for publishing information that isn't flattering to them, right? Basically, when the U.S. government asks, does this law or war make me look like an authoritarian dictator with an assassination complex? And we answer, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, because it's like the truth. <laughs> the truth it's, hurts. The truth hurts. And that's why they get to imprison and torture us when we give them the truth. This opens the door to any global government to extradite people from the U.S. and try them under their version of the Espionage Act, right? This affects the people's right to know. It's about transparency, 
You have things like corporate ad gag laws, which are laws that prevent journalists from talking about the horrors of things like factory farms in tandem with authoritarian governments and legislation like the Espionage Act. And that would mean that we, don't, we wouldn't get to know where our food comes from, how we're endangering the planet, why we are at war, and how the intelligence industrial complex is going to create another false coup for no goddamn reason. This is about our freedoms, right? Our freedom to criticize and push back against a government that distrusts us and uses fear as a prime motive to strip us of our rights. This is about ensuring that when these people in power are caught with their pants down committing heinous crimes, they are punished for it. We don't have any freedoms if whistleblowers like Assange and Snowden and Daniel Everett Hale are kept in prison under the Espionage Act. The end. Thank you very much uh, for, for hanging out and tuning in. Uh, you guys are awesome. And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up. Give it a share and make sure people get to actually see this. Share this with your friends. Share this with your enemies. Share this with whoever you think is going to be uh, excited about uh, a content like this. If you're watching this on the, the Facebooks or the YouTubes, if that is your way that you enjoy watching uh, this show, then please make sure that you are subscribed. Please make sure that you hit the bell to get notifications about new videos that I'll be dropping. Uh, I drop videos every single week on this channel. Uh, if you're listening to the audio version, please subscribe there and write us a review. And if you're on Rockfin, thank you for watching this show on Rockfin. Rockfin is a uh, crypto blockchain a content producer friendly uh, platform. It's like the Netflix for uh, co uh, content producers, especially if you like political commentary content like Graham Elwood and Ron Placone, Jimmy Dore, Kim Iverson, Nico House, Convo Couch, uh, Richard Mendhurst, a ton of other people are on Rockfin. And if you, uh, if you subscribe, it's $10 a month, you get access to all of the premium content that is not just available on my channel, but on every single person on Rockfin's channel. So you can go uh, check my Rockfin channel out at rockfin.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, for show dates to make donations, check out past videos, past podcasts, uh, to, to, to see what press interviews I've done. Uh, you can go directly to my website, which is krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, thank you to all the people that have already become patrons already become subscribers, continue to come out to these uh, live virtual comedy shows. Uh, it means a lot, and I really appreciate you guys. Uh, but till next week, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you on the road.